Hey, Polaris, wanted to talk to you quick about communion. Um, so this is something that we do every Sunday, uh, whether it's online or in person. And uh, so we're going to take bread, which symbolizes Jesus' body that was broken for us, and juice, which symbolizes his blood that was poured out for us for our sins. Um, so if you need to take a moment right now to pause the video and get uh, communion ready, some crackers or bread or uh, juice or whatever, um, that's totally fine. And then come back in a second and you can press play and take communion together as a church. So yeah, let's go ahead and pray. God, thank you for the time that we have together. Uh, we know that we are bound together by your love. Uh, we know that we are together in spirit, whether uh, we are right next to each other or, you know, in our own homes. Uh, I just pray that you would help us through this time to be able to feel like we're a part uh, of the community, uh, even though there's still just kind of uh, the distancing that is necessary uh, sometimes. Um, so just help us to uh, focus on you and your love that binds us together. And thank you so much for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, let's take communion together. Bye. 
In the very beginning, nothing existed except for God. God spoke and created the heavens and the earth. When he first created the earth, it had no shape, and total darkness covered the earth. The Spirit of God was present, hovering over the waters. God said, let there be light, and light was created. God separated the light from the dark. The light was called day, and the darkness was called night. God saw the light, and he knew that it was good. This all happened on the first day of creation. God began to separate the waters that were on the surface of the earth with the waters that were above the earth. God created a great expanse between the water on the earth and the water that was above the earth. He called this expanse the sky. This all happened on the second day of creation. Then God created dry land on the earth. The waters were gathered together to one place, and then the dry land appeared. The dry land was called earth. And the waters, they were called seas. God then commanded the earth to grow plants and trees. And the plants and trees grew. And then God once again knew, this is good. This all happened on the third day of creation. Next, God placed lights in the sky. He created the sun to shine during the day and the moon and the stars to shine at night. God gave us lights to provide light on the earth, to separate day from night, and to help us track time in days and years. This all happened on the fourth day of creation. God created all living things that are in the water and all the birds that fly. God made them multiply and fill the earth and the sea. God again saw that this was good. This all happened on the fifth day of creation. And finally, God created the animals to cover the earth. The animals multiplied as well until they covered the entire earth. God looked down on his creation and again he knew, this is good. Then God created people. God created people differently than anything else that he had created. God created people in his very own image. God took dust from the ground and he made a man. God took his very own breath and breathed into the man and the man became alive. God then took a rib from the man and created a woman to become the man's helper and spouse. God named them Adam and Eve. God asked the man and woman to care for the garden in which he had placed them in and to take care of the earth. God told the man and woman, you can eat from any tree that I've created. He said the trees were food for all the wildlife and the animals and the people that he had created. God's one warning was about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of this tree, God warned the man and woman, do not eat or you will die. This all happened on the sixth day of creation. On the seventh day of creation, God rested from all of his work. And then he looked out on all that he had created. And he said, this is good. This is very, very good. Colossians 1, 15 through 22 reveals that Christ is ruler over all of God's creation. All of creation was created through him, by him, and for him. Everything was created to give glory to Christ but people would choose not to give him glory. 
The rest of the Bible reveals how Jesus would restore the relationship between God and man. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us from wherever you are this morning. This is the July 5th edition of our Polaris virtual service. Now, this is a special one because this is actually the Sunday that we have begun to meet on site again after a hundred and some days. And, you know, I just want you to know watching, um, watching virtually that uh, I want you to feel okay about that. Uh, I want you to take your time. Don't feel any rush. Please don't feel, because I've heard this some, don't feel like there's some kind of a test of faith or like you should somehow spiritually be okay with worshiping uh, at the church building. If you're not comfortable, if you have reasons that you feel like you shouldn't, don't worry about that. I want you to be thrilled with yourself that you're choosing to watch this and experience um, or go to church virtually. So this morning, we are going to start uh, for the month of July a study on the book of Ruth. And, and here's what I want to do. Now, because we're going to go virtual, our, our, um, our on-site services are only going to be about 45 minutes. The, the teachings are going to be a little bit shorter. So what I want to do each uh, week is we're going to look at some aspects of the book of Ruth, and then you do some homework. The book of Ruth is a short book. It's toward the beginning of the Bible, and uh, and there are only four chapters. So you should be able to read the book of Ruth in between 20 to 30 minutes. So I would love for you, and you'll get the most out of this, if you each week set aside 30 minutes on different days, you know, five minutes a day, whatever, and read through the book of Ruth and then use the information that you got from each virtual service and apply that to your weekly reading of Ruth. And by the end of the month, you'll know a lot about a book of the Bible. You'll know a lot about Ruth. You'll know the story of Ruth on a lot of different levels. So book of Ruth, very, very, very old. It takes place, and we'll see this in a minute, uh, toward the beginning of the Bible story. And uh, you see, uh, it's an interesting book because you see sort of all the the intrigue and romance and softness of the Hallmark Channel, the Hallmark Christmas movie. Uh, but then there's this there's this deep political um, kind of 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 power narrative, which has all the makings of a 1980s. 1990s Public Enemy album. So it's kind of like Hallmark meets Public Enemy. It reminds me a lot of of uh, that iconic Mr. Rogers moment when when he, Mr. Rogers, imagine how scandalous, was actually soaking his feet in the kiddie pool alongside of a black man. And and all the the political, this is a kid's show, but then this subversive, yet really kind of in-your-face a political statement, a civil rights statement uh, that that moment in that show made, how powerful that was. That's what we get in the book of Ruth, and you'll see that a little bit today and, and as we continue. So, so here are a couple themes that I want you to think about. Uh, again, the book of Ruth is very much a love story. It's kind of a romance story. Um, it's a damsel in distress is rescued kind of story, yet in this story, this damsel in distress is actually uh, that it, it's it's two women who are very much shaping the narrative. So think about the the implications of that when it comes to gender and gender equality and the rights of women and the power of women. That this ancient ancient story, actually, it's two women who shape and move the narrative and the person of wealth, the man, the caregiver, the caretaker. Actually, I don't want to say he gets played because it's a, he's a willing participant, but the the scheme or whatever you want to call it, the plot, uh, it is driven very much by the thinking and the wit of women. So you have uh, that. Then uh, there's definitely some um, uh, immigrant themes 
immigration themes, themes of who's in and who's out. So still very relevant to 2020. And uh, a, a lot of the um, a lot of the issues that are going to surround this next um, election season uh, right there in this ancient love story, four chapters long, thousands of years old. And, and that's one of the things that I'm so I got to be careful here because the intro is going to be the the, the entire uh, um, teaching time. Uh, but the Bible itself uh, here, it's been for thousands of years. And, and while it may not come out and make these powerful statements, they're there if we're willing to mine for them. So you got some immigration stuff. You got some women's rights and equality and, 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 and power stuff. And, and then there's also, um, <clears throat> very much a on the, on the grace side of things, there's a who belongs and who doesn't. Who did, who is God for? Uh, as, as God is for you, God is for them. Uh, God loves them. Who, who is God for? Who's in and who's out? I, I know there is a, a story in local church legend about a longtime secretary who used to, um, she used to decide who, what visitors would get a welcome letter. And she would size them up and the things that I've heard said, and maybe that maybe the story is just urban legend, but it certainly rings true and I'm sure is true in certain places. And maybe some of you can even picture people in your life that were like this. Uh, she would size up how the person looked and whether they were riffraff or whether they belonged at their church. And that's who she would decide to send the welcome stuff to. Who's in, who's out, and maybe even you struggle with, or maybe some of you have been on the receiving end of, of kind of, you belong or you don't belong. I hear people all the time, I say this a lot, say, well, I can never go to church. God would strike the building with lightning. Uh, very much the idea of a person feeling like they don't belong in God's story. And, and we're going to see that come into play today. So I'm just going to read a few verses from Ruth today, and then we'll make a few implications, and then it's going to depend a lot on you reading this incredible story, and then each week we'll add to your understanding of that story. If you read it through four times this month, I think you'll know a lot about what God is doing uh, through this story of Ruth. So here we go. <clears throat> this is Ruth chapter one. In the days when the judges ruled. So right there we can stop. That's just the first half of the first verse. In the J in the days when the judges ruled. So um this was a point in time. So so here's the Bible. Uh Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's kind of the 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 framework uh, of of the Bible called the the Torah. And um uh, th then you go Joshua and Judges. So we're in the first, you know, Judges is the seventh book of the Bible, and it's the stories of the, the very tribal. It's calling uh, the, the author here in the days when the judges ruled, he's calling us back to a very tribal existence. It was like the wild, wild west of the Bible. When when these these mighty warriors would rise up as the Israelites tried to establish themselves and they kind of get here and then they'd fall away and they'd fall apart and then a judge would rise up and help them rise up and then they would fall away and fall apart. So so it points to this kind of cycle of of getting your stuff together and then falling apart. So it's the addict that, that maybe puts together a streak of days and then collapses. Or you finally get your finances and you make some good decisions and then you go binge buy something and get into debt again. Or it speaks to that, just that cycle of humanity of getting it right and then falling apart and then getting it right and then falling apart. In the days the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Now, this was an explosive sentence. A man from Bethlehem in Judah went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Why did they go? 
because there was a famine. Now, in the ancient world, I can't even begin to, to fully explain in the short amount of time we have uh, what all this implied, but it's, it's kind of like everything that that's frustrating about trying to live well. Moab, and this is crucial if you want to understand Ruth, Moab uh, and the Moabites were the arch enemy to the Israelites. To, to God and his people, Moab and the Moabites were, were the, the closest thing we could, and, and my apologies to my Russian friends out there, but there was like in the Cold War era, when and, and still even now politically, when you just heard the, the Russians, it was like uh, the Russians, and, and Rocky IV is part of why I have that, you know, in, in my subconscious that you associate when you grew up, when I did, in the season of life that I did, the Russians were the bad guys, and in the movies, whatever, even the Russian accent was associated with our, our, our country's arch rival. So think Rocky IV and, and the Moabites were the big powerful enemies to, to Rocky, to the good guys, the God and his people, the Israelites. So, so when an Israelite who grew up in Bethlehem, like, you know, a big deal, Israel city, Israelite city, there was a famine which was so often associated in the ancient world with your God is against you or your God can't provide for you. And what does he do? He goes to the land of the enemy so that he can find enough for his family. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malan and Kilian. They were... Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and they lived there. So you have a man who these the, the men these men become irrelevant really quick in the story, okay? But you have a man and his wife Naomi, and then their two sons, and they're off in a foreign land to try to provide food for their family in a time of famine, because in their own land, they're not making it. Well, shortly later, uh, in another theme that we're going to talk about in the fourth week is, um, is this is a story of great loss, great loss, because Naomi loses her husband and her two sons. So she's in a foreign land, and she loses her husband and two sons. Now, one of her sons, marries a Moabite woman named Ruth. So there's Naomi and there's Ruth. And as this story develops, I'm just going to give you a little overview of, of what happens here. Naomi at some point was thriving, doing just fine in Bethlehem with her husband and her two sons. Then there's a famine and things just start to fall apart. Their world goes all 2020 on them, okay? Everything was going well. And all of a sudden, there's this string of events and things start to go poorly. There's a famine. They move to the, the land of the enemy. And maybe some of you can relate. Maybe some of you, like, you have to go ask that family member for help because your life is falling apart. Or somehow you have to just take some kind of humiliating stance but they go to the enemy. And, and not only were they enemies, the Moabites were seen as bad people who did awful things to foreign gods and for foreign gods. Uh, their, their actual creation story in, in, in Genesis, the, the, the founding of, of the, uh, of the Moabite people was from, uh, a lot's daughters. Uh, getting him drunk and taking advantage of him and they get pregnant from their own dad. And, and, and that's where the Moabites came from, according to the book of Genesis. And it just went downhill from there. So when you get to the idea of the Moabites in this story, they're the bad guys. But one of the sons of Naomi, uh, who's now a widow, had married a Moabite woman named Ruth. And then the sons die, but this Moabite woman, and we're going to talk more about this next week, Ruth, 
uh, links up with Naomi and they journey back to Bethlehem. So if you're evaluating this story, um, Naomi is, is one of the good guys, good girls, and um, Ruth should be a bad girl. She's an enemy. She does not belong in the story, which begs to question then, why did this story make it? Why did these four chapters stand out enough to be included in the scriptures? What was it that God saw or that the Israelites saw in this story that spiritually minded people saw that kept this in a relatively small collection of works that we call our Bible. Well, as the story moves on, we're going to see in the coming weeks that when Naomi and Ruth move back to Bethlehem, they've lost everything. Uh, Naomi's carrying a great deal of bitterness. It's a fairly dangerous environment for them to move back into. Um, Naomi and Ruth end up connecting with a man named Boaz. Boaz ends up marrying Ruth, which is an incredible story of, of grace and redemption. Uh, we'll learn about that and apply that to the story. But, but in the midst of this story of great loss and of, of someone who clearly doesn't belong, the Moabite, not only was she a foreigner, like not one of the proud uh, race of the Israelites, but she also would have been very far from, from uh, spiritually from a lot of the values in the Israelites. But, but look at what happens at the end of Ruth. So I hope when you take time this week to read this story, you, you start there with in the days of the judges ruled, and you'll understand what that means in the implications of Bethlehem and a Moabite, but then look at the end of the story. This is how it ends. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashan. Nashan, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, who married Ruth, who was the Moabite, who lost her husband, whose mother was Naomi. So Boaz was the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, Jesse the father of King David. So this is fascinating for us because King David was like the patriarch, the great king, the face of Israelite success. And we find that King David, the face of everything that God was doing uh, and in many ways would do through his people, his great grandmother was actually a Moabite. This was scandalous, but it's a part of the scandalous grace that we see all through scripture. And you know, you, you can know like this story made it. And it made it for a reason. Any other king at that time would have wiped that out. Like if that was true and you somehow had bad, bad people in your blood, you had the enemies in your blood, you would never want that known that, that your enemies were a part of your bloodline. But these scriptures, um, there's power in that. This story made it. Even in, in, in ancient Israel, they wanted to know that somehow God's, a, a greater part of God's redemptive story was that he could even include the Moabites in this. And it makes a powerful story of redemption all the way around that even in great loss, all of a sudden it's still a part of God's plan, not only for your life, but in the life of generations to come. We'll talk about that more on the last week of the month, but then I want you to see something else. 
so we said, uh, what, Salmon was the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, Jesse the father of King David. That's in the book of Ruth. That's how the book of Ruth ends. <clears throat> Let's look at Matthew. When Jesus comes into the world, Matthew announces the bloodline because that's what you did back then. To validate a king, you announce the bloodline. But look what Matthew says. This is Matthew 1. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. So Matthew wants to make sure that we all know, hey, Ruth, the Moabite, is a part of this story. Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of David. David, the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. More scandal right there. Salmon, the father of Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, the father of Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. I just like to say that name. Uh, then on down later, Iliud, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Mathan. Mathan, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. So in this story of great loss where God seemed miles away, why'd they have to leave Bethlehem? Why couldn't their God provide for them? Why did they have to go to the enemy's house to get food? Then why would God take her husband and her sons away from her? And now this Moabite, this bad girl who believes all the wrong things, she follows them back, but then ends up through redemption in the very story of the bloodline that led to the Messiah who would save the world. Is there any greater way that God could say everybody can be a part of this? Everybody can be a part of this, and no matter who you are, no matter how far you've been, no matter who they are, no matter how far they are, no matter how bad they've been to you, God can redeem anything. So whenever you're tempted to think about who's in and who's out and who can be saved and who can be made right with God and what, what, how could this possibly turn into something that God could use? It's too late. It's too far gone. It's too big of a mess. According to this little hallmarkish book of Ruth that has all the political power of a public enemy album. According to this, there is no people group that God does not love or that God is not for. And be careful what people group you write off because God may just use them to save you. He may just use them to change the world. And he is very much for even people who are the furthest from him. Tons of of explosive political and personal implications and spiritual implications for you, uh, for this next election, um, for whether or not you can be a part of, of something God is doing, whether or not God can redeem your life, whether or not God can redeem their life. My gosh, you could just talk all day about this. So I'm going to wrap up and, and I'm going to let you go and read Ruth. And I hope you'll do that. And I hope you'll look for some of these themes and we'll add more themes as the month goes on. Thanks and have a good week. Let's pray and then we'll do one last song. <clears throat> Father, thank you that this story made it. I'm so thankful that, that you are ready to use anyone. Uh, Anyone who will turn to you, anyone that will journey with you, you will make their story um, incredible and and um, fulfilling and impactful. Uh, you will bring legacy into our life when we live for more and live for you. And I pray that this story would influence how we see others and how we see ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. One last song. Have a good week.
you and have a great week.